Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm not sure we can follow up uh, Linda and Noah, but um, could not be more excited to uh, get to uh, introduce our, our next guest. I'm Jeff Richards, by the way. I'm a board member at Percolate. Uh, lucky to have met Noah and James three years ago and be an investor in the company. And uh, James and I were talking over the summer about this conference, and he said, you know, I'm really looking for uh, kind of superstar, global thinkers, out of the box, you know, we don't want to do product demos and like really boring stuff. And I said, well, you know, I have a friend who knows Esther and we've met and it'd be great if we could get her and uh, so here we are. And I think I could take 20 minutes just introducing her, uh, but I won't. Uh, I would encourage all of you to just do a Google search for Esther Dyson. You'll see an amazing amount of stuff that comes up on Wikipedia and elsewhere. But um, you know, maybe just just briefly, uh, if I could, and I, I know okay. you don't want to go through your whole background. Um, I'll give you guys a couple of data points. When you look it up on Wikipedia, um, it actually says, the, the opening says, Esther Dyson is a Swiss-born American journalist, author, businesswoman, investor, commentator, and philanthropist. And at Mrs. Cosmonaut. Right, and Cosmonaut, right, which is further down. Yeah. Um, but she has founded companies, she's written books, uh, she's founded nonprofits, she's an amazing angel investor. If you are a Silicon Valley slash tech geek, uh, you know who Esther Dyson is. She sits on the board of 23andMe, which is a very cool uh, DNA related company. She sat on the board of ICANN, she was on the board of WPP Global, which is relevant to everyone in this audience uh, up until last year, I believe, or yeah. about a year ago. Um, yeah, after 14 years. Yeah, and has been at the center of the technology industry for, for a long time. And um, so really excited to have you here. Thanks. And, um, you know, maybe I could just start off with sort of a broad question, which is the whole point of this conference is sort of thinking about a richer, more connected world. And, um, you know, your view on the technology industry and sort of where we are today versus where we've been and where we're going. and. You know, maybe I, I know Noah and others have asked the question, are you optimistic? Are you positive? Yeah. Are we doing good things? So I'm really pessimistic about what I see, yet I'm very optimistic because I'm trying to do something about it. And yeah, otherwise, what's the point? of? I'm doing it because I think it might make a difference. And fundamentally, we've heard a lot Jeffrey West in particular and Max Roser, long-term stuff, sustainability, incomes rising, that's all really exciting. But we are neglecting the sustainability of the human body. You know, what is all this stuff for? Well, it's for people to enjoy, uh, maybe for them to be productive. But in the end, for any of this to be worthwhile, you need people with healthy bodies so that they have the capacity to do all this and with healthy souls so that they have the capacity to enjoy it, to, to care. And you know, it's like we're maintaining our cars. We worry about containers and all this stuff. <laughs> but we're thinking so incredibly short term about human bodies. And as we get richer, we get the financial capability to buy stuff that's bad for us. Yeah, we evolved to like stuff that was scarce, but now when it's in profusion, it's killing us. And that's bad food, it's alcohol, smoking, uh, staying up too late with your iPad, enjoying New York's nightlife. If any of you's from out of town, yeah, do it once or twice, but <laughs> not every night. Uh, so what I'm doing now is pretty much an experiment to show what it looks like if you think long term and you invest in health instead of renting it. Because uh, when you rent it, you end up at 50 or 60 and you no longer have it and then it costs a huge amount of money and of course a lot of agony to try and get it back. And talk, so I know you're spending a lot of time on health and it's a topic you're really passionate about. So you've got this program called Way to Wellville Right. Um, maybe Courtesy could, of our CEO, who's a really good marketing guy, among other things. <laughs> maybe you could just talk a little about what is it and, and what are the goals and yeah. what do you hope to accomplish? So it's, it's five communities. Uh, we did not pick them, well, we picked them out of 42 that applied. And these were communities of under 100,000 people, so to limit the complexity, both political and financial, uh, had to be small and remote so that whatever you 
did there, it didn't seep out. If you had a diabetes program, it was complementary to the mental health support. And you got kind of this critical density, interacting, synergistic, or whatever. Uh, and they had to have, they had to already be interested in improving their health. It wasn't like a nice white lady from New York is here to tell you how to live, <laughs> but <laughs> more, you want to be healthy? We can help you. We know these important people in New York. We speak at conferences. Uh, there may be some food companies listening who want to figure out how to market their healthy menus. We've got great test markets where we will support you. Uh, we know financial people who might want to invest in a pay-for-success diabetes prevention bond because if you invest $10 million now, your health costs five or eight years down the line are going to be millions of dollars less if you can find a counterparty who will pay you. So Spartanburg, South Carolina, there's usually always somebody who's from one of these places. Muskegon, Michigan, Niagara Falls, New York, Clatsop County, Oregon, uh, Lake County, California. There we go. Someone? That's somebody. Okay. Good. Uh, it's where all the fires are. And so, <laughs> no, we're hoping that uh, we can help them rebuild and include a rec center. And there's a lot of things you can do if you build a community mindfully. And are we, um, you know, is, is Fitbit an indicator that people are starting to care about health at all with technology? Is it, I mean, yeah. are we headed in that direction? Because part of the problem is people themselves don't seem to care, right? We're, we're eating McDonald's and staying out late. And uh, I mean, where, where, where does that, is that a sign that there's progress? Yeah, or? so it's very complicated. First, I've learned so much more than I knew about race and income incarceration. If you're rich and well-educated, the Fitbit is great. And, but it's not simply, let's go and give all these poor people a Fitbit. Uh, first of all, they don't have time. The healthy food is not available. It's, it's a combination of stuff. I'm very excited because just like an oil thing in your car that you know when to change your oil, the Fitbit, it's, it's so steps on a device are kind of like click-throughs in marketing. You know, they're an indicator, but what you really want is the impact down the line. Uh, are people going to buy your thing? And click-throughs are a start. But so partly our issues are around attribution. Anyway, you need to focus on the outcomes. And so what's more interesting than Fitbits and things like that are going to be real-time blood glucose measurements and things where you can actually see the state of your body, not simply what you're doing to it, even if what you're doing is good. Because there's no real-time feedback on your health. I mean, yeah, you feel bad after the night out, but then you recover. And you don't realize how badly you're deteriorating until it's too late. Yeah. So technology information helps. Certainly social media, if you can, if you can make healthy food fashionable, if you can change the way people think about things, the way they change thinking about the environment or smoking, but fundamentally, you also need to change the choices that are available to people, which is, and congratulations for s serving unsweetened yogurt here. <laughs> it's, it's something that really bugs me because a cupcake, you know what it is. But sweetened yogurt is really dessert masquerading as something healthy, and that bugs me. So. And, uh, and um it is health something that, so obviously our audience is, is heavily oriented towards marketing, brands, yeah. et cetera. Is, is wellness and health a brand component that you're seeing companies embrace? Should they embrace? Should um, they try to embrace? The problem is when they, often they embrace it like saying yogurt is good for you, <laughs> when not all yogurt is. Mm. But ultimately, yeah, I want to be the food company's friend, not demonize them because we need food companies to produce healthy food, distribute it, market it, promote it. Uh, but I'd like them to be a little more candid about what it is they're selling sometimes. And at the same time, I want consumers to be more knowledgeable and to be willing to pay for stuff that's good for them. So it's, it's a complicated thing and 
that's what we're trying to do in these five small places to show what does it look like when people start manipulating themselves rather than just being manipulated. When the community collectively decides we want a healthy environment and you know it's easy, five years later we want the mayor to say, this is great, people want mm -hmm. to move to my town. The real estate vendor says, housing prices are going up. The school principal says, school graduation rates are going up. The sheriff says, my jails are empty and it's not because we're not catching people. And these are all uh, consequences or outcomes you're hoping to achieve with the Way to Wellville projects and sort of trying to understand the attribution of yeah. how that's all happening. And we have five places. If all five work out, it would be a miracle. Yeah. But if three work out, it's, it's not that we've discovered the magic. It's more we want people to look at that and be inspired and figure out how to do it in their own communities. And yes, maybe some of what we do as collective action may end up having to be done by government interference. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things um, James and I were talking about is, you know, you're, you were sort of at the early and at the center of the internet and software, and you've sort of been early on a lot of technology trends that, that play out over a long period of time. One of the challenges I think everybody deals with when you're working inside of a company is, you know, you, you hear the mantra, think big, think long term, have a great five to 10 year plan. And then it's like, hey, that you know, get that project done by Friday. So, how do you, how do you in your life, and and how have you seen great entrepreneurs and great technology folks balance long term with short term? It's one of the things that yeah. I, I think that you know, James and Nora are really trying to emphasize with this conference is thinking big, thinking longer term. And how have you done that? Because you've, I mean, you've done an amazing yeah. job of it, investing early in companies and writing books and doing all the things way ahead of every everyone else. Well, one one way to be patient as an investor is to have a lot of investments. Because if you were waiting for just one to do something or get, you, you, yeah, having a divided attention span enables you to focus on one thing at a time and you, know, you come back later and you discover something that happened. In terms of Hiccup, uh, which is Health Initiative Coordinating Council, is the parent of Way to Wellville, it's not for profit. Uh, but really thinking long term is. It's a combination of discipline and just being brutally honest and sort of scientific. If, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the consequences of what you do short term. Actually, there's a, there's a wonderful book. It's called Scarcity by Sendhil Mullanathan and Eldar Shafir, whom you should have next year at this event. Uh, basically, to explain scarcity to rich people you have to talk about time instead of mm -hmm. money. But rich people are very short of time, and so they do stupid things because they want <laughs> immediate results because they're, they're juggling too many things, and you need to. So you were going to ask me about swimming. I swim for 50 minutes every day. This is, by the way, this is the question James wanted me to make sure I asked. Yeah. Tell and us about your swimming. It's, <laughs> it's really less to keep healthy and more so I'm like all of you. I spend my time on the phone. I'm writing email. Usually I'm doing email while I'm on the phone and you know, listening in the green room while talking to somebody and running around. But when I'm in the pool, I've got 50 minutes with no computer, usually no pen and paper, though I sometimes keep it to write notes with. I jump out of the pool and write something. Uh, and I think about what makes sense. Does, what is going to be my approach to negotiating with this outfit? Uh, should I really go to this event versus that event? Uh, does it really make sense? So for example, we're doing a flu shot thing in Muskegon. And originally it was going to be, oh, we're going to have the biggest one day flu shot thing and win the Guinness World Book of Records, but it's, the logistics are crazy, and we're not really interested in a big event. We're interested in five months later, does the incidence of flu go down, not just among the people who are vaccinated, but overall? And this is kind of a learning exercise around measuring impact rather than input. So figuring out stuff like that, you can do, you can't do it when you're on the phone. Uh, and you do it every day, even when every you day. travel. Even when I travel. Yeah. Uh, 
even, you know, I know pretty much every Munich airport, the Hilton, you can do it on your layover. So, so like, yeah. uh, like Tim's book on containers, you could write the book on Swimming where to pools. swim when you're traveling. Totally. <laughs> um, maybe, t can you just talk for a few minutes about WPP? You were on the board there for, I think, 14 years. Probably saw, you know, yeah. the evolution of digital, a whole bunch of great things over the last 14 years. Anything that this audience could take away from that experience or that you learned in that experience? Sure. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, NS how many of you are here are from WPP? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not going to say anything that is a secret or indiscreet or anything like that, but it, it was a real company. It was wonderful to kind of be on the inside because I spent my whole life not being inside big things. I had my own small newsletter, which I finally, and conference, which I finally sold in 2005. So I could go anywhere in the world pretty much, and there was some WPP office that could give me real insight into the local consumer culture, which is kind of interesting. It's a lot more interesting than going to a museum. Uh, you know, watch the change from advertising, 30 second spots, every board meeting we would have a reel, and they were great. Uh, I still love some of those ads. But over time, it changed to a lot more digital, research, the internet matters. Mm -hmm. And you know, watching consumer behavior change, and every year we would see the charts on how much time people were spending on mobile, even though the advertisers were not spending on mobile. And now that's finally beginning to change, and it's interesting, and now you have the sort of the challenge between the mobile web, which is pretty much giving way to mobile apps and those are much harder to get to but yeah which what, uh, off the top i didn't ask you this in advance so yeah but, but off the top of your head like are there companies that you really admire that you say these are you know of my in my time in tech these are a couple of companies that i think are doing it right uh, okay it, it could be in tech or not tech yeah well it goes my very first love was federal express that was when i started on speaking of tim one uh when i started off on Wall Street, I was covering FedEx, which at the time had not even shipped its first package. And then the first week, you know, it was two on Monday, five on Tuesday, wow. eight on Wednesday. It was watching what they did and watching how they created a market rather than just entering one. And what's really interesting about them is they, they took a very complicated business, which was moving packages from place to place. And they made it very simple. They just sent them all to Memphis and sent them all back. And that made a whole lot of sense before we had the dynamic real-time yield managing, uh, real-time dynamic scheduling that we have now. So watching the world change and how they've adjusted to it, but to be honest, now you have Uber and mm -hmm. You have peer-to-peer -peer instead of FedEx being the most exciting thing. Uh, I really love, I love Uber's data science. I'm not so sure about its management or its <laughs> culture. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's fascinating to watch. And those of you who use it, they finally figured out what to do at airports. Yeah. Because they had a, a huge problem of you get out of the airport and you don't know what terminal you're in or are you on the lower level or the upper level and they, they've they solved that and that's brilliant. Uh, and they need to keep doing that because there are other people chasing it. Yeah. What about space? You mentioned ah, uh, yeah. a cosmonaut. I know it's something you're very passionate about. Ha ha tell us a little about what's going on there. Well, Since most of us have not yeah. been to space, we've so spent a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> Spa space is for the pessimistic view. It's, it's a really useful, we need Mars as a backup planet. <laughs> and we can go and fix Mars without the political problems we have trying to fix, for example, the environment or the, the atmosphere on Earth, on, on Mars. You know, there's nobody living there that, we that know. will complain <laughs> <laughs> to disturb. And I mean, I'm, I'm interested in synthetic biology, which if, if Wellville works out, 10 years from now, I hope to be doing synthetic biology and maybe 
10 years after that, I can retire on Mars. But the solution to creating an atmosphere on Mars is not building domes. It is, in fact, synthetic biology and creating some kind of organisms that can fix the atmosphere. And, and you know, we may still have to build some kind of sphere around it. I'm not sure. But construction is very slow compared to biology. And somehow that refers back to what Jeff West was talking about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a good thing that people die because we can keep improving them. On the other hand, something that lives forever has to be more organic and diverse. Uh, Bill Gates used to talk about the digital nervous system, which is very hierarchical. The digital immune system is, is fundamentally not that diverse, though your microbiome is. But things that live forever, they, they need to be they need diversity because you never know what they're going to encounter. And so you need a few things that will survive no matter what happens to live on. Based on what Jeff said, should we all be thinking more about space? <laughs> are, um, we, are we on the... No, as I said, I'm optimistic. Yeah. But I, I really think we, we do need to deal with human sustainability above all, or otherwise there won't be any people to enjoy this stuff. And are you seeing other people, and I, we've got to wrap up, but yeah. are you seeing other people like you take an interest in these projects? Yeah that are thinking five, 10 years holistically about how all these things tie together around health and wellness and community Mark, beyond just. Yeah, Mark Bertolini at Aetna is one. I mean, we, there's nothing unique or original about what I'm doing except that I'm doing it. Uh, but these ideas around sustainability and producing health, it's, it's in the air. And so we're trying to accelerate it, but we're not pretending that we're unique. What we are trying to do, for those of you who know Wall Street, is we're trying to create health as an asset class, something that an investor can invest in. Mm. And it's, it's complicated because, again, the, the beneficiaries and the, invest, the people who build health, it's, it's a community asset in many ways rather than an individual's. But it's just financial engineering. Yeah. Well, I, I could go on all day with you. I wish we had. Uh two hours instead of 20 minutes. Um, the audience would get tired. No, no, I think they'd, but we be, would have I think fun. they'd be excited. Um, but I would encourage all of you, if you, uh, you know, this is just a, a taste. There's a lot of, there's books, there's all kinds of things that about Esther on the web that are really fascinating. And it's uh, true. I really enjoyed having you here. Uh, Thank you. And some of it's true. Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed having you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Great.